I'm so happy to be sitting in front of this computer and watching it work. I bought it from someone in Germany and spent the last several weeks learning about it, cleaning it and restoring. I'm recording this when all that work has already been done and you can see the end result on my desk. But let me now rewind the tape and share with you what I've done to and what I've learned about the astounding Amiga 3000 tower. Amiga 3000 Tower, introduced in 1991, was Commodore's response to the needs of professionals who considered Amiga the go-to platform for graphics, sound and video work, but were unhappy with the expansion capabilities of the existing models. To understand the computer's reception, one needs to remember the historic context of the late 80s and early 90s. The Internet was not really there yet, and most software was bought or exchanged on floppy disks, as CD-ROMs hadn't yet started to gain the momentum. Big box Amigas had the reputation of the go-to computers for sound and video processing as well as gaming. However, the competition was not sleeping and people were starting to turn to Macintoshes and PC clones to get the same or better features. Amiga users were hungry for development. That was the landscape into which Commodore introduced the Amiga 3000 Tower. The computer, referred to as a multimedia workstation in the official press release, had been rumored for over a year before being announced on August 20, 1991. On the day before the announcement, the Hurricane Bob hit the northeastern United States Dave Haney, Commodore's head of engineering who traveled to Boston on just a 12-hour notice, mentioned travel delays caused by the hurricane, but ultimately was able to present the machine in a small MIT hall together with Commodore's marketing director, David Archambault. Commodore made units available to developers in September and to the general public in October. There were shortages and delays as the machine was manufactured in Braunschweig in Germany and often shipped to the US dealers in small batches. Mine has the serial number 1050, but some of these Amigas did not even have a serial number, which today makes it difficult to estimate the total number of manufactured units. Chris Edwards in his YouTube channel mentions 8000 manufactured machines. I am estimating that at most a few hundred are still in existence. There is surprisingly little one can find about this Amiga model, not only in general computing magazines, but even in specialized Amiga press. The new Amiga 3000T Multimedia Workstation Tower, the most expandable, flexible Amiga ever built, reads a Commodore ad in Compute Magazine of October 1992. The ad was published when the Amiga had been already for a year on the market and was now reintroduced with a 040 CPU. It cost close to 6,000 US dollars, that is well over 12,000 dollars today. Even the most basic version, as introduced in August 1991, cost 4,500 US dollars, that is close to 10,000 in today's money. This makes Amiga 3000T the most expensive Commodore Amiga in history, with only one close runner-up, its successor, A4K Tower, which we reviewed recently. And talking about prices, 
In August 1992, one of the Amiga World editors had fun building the ultimate Amiga, based on the A3K tower. His final maxed out config clocked at 20,000 US dollars, which is 43,000 US dollars today. I was very excited when I received the package from Germany. The machine, wrapped in a blanket, was not in a very good shape. It was dirty, the key lock was broken beyond repair, and the battery was leaking. The A3K specific mouse, called Pregnant Mouse, which is a rare collector item these days, is damaged most likely beyond repair. But I may make an attempt at restoring it in future videos. Otherwise, it seems the computer hasn't been modified or expanded since the 90s. The serial number is the same on the case, the motherboard and the power supply. One thing that struck me is that the date stamp on the inside of the case in my machine reads December 1990. So even though not launched until late 1991, the machines, or at least the cases, were manufactured as early as 1990, which is also confirmed by the PCB silk screen with the copyright year 1990. The 280 watt power supply is the most powerful of all Amiga models. In addition to supplying 5 and 12 volt lines, it delivers 50 Hz tick signal, which is received by the CIA chip for use as an accurate time reference. The PSU is heavy and the build is complicated, with capacitors cramped into a small space. For now, I have only washed the PSU thoroughly and measured the voltages under continuous load but ultimately I will have to replace the capacitors, which is going to be an interesting project in itself. The Amiga A3K Tower motherboard is pretty amazing. Well, obviously this is not an Amiga A3K Tower motherboard, I have it only for size comparison because this is the actual A3K Tower motherboard and this is your regular Baby AT motherboard which you know very well from PC computers. Look at the size. A3K Tower motherboard is twice the size of Baby AT motherboard. It is very very big. Uh, there's a lot more here than in the four K tower that we um, uh, were discussing in a different video, simply because in 4K tower the modules for input output and for audio video and for disk were separated out of the motherboard. Here this is all integrated into the motherboard and because of that this is big and it's, it's, it's complicated and uh, uh, and uh, quite fascinating. So let's start by just describing the very general functional areas of the motherboard. This part here, uh, let's say north, east or top right, is the CPU and uh, memory, uh, memory section. So this is the memory here, the CPU, FPU, the uh, fast CPU slot. Then here you have the input and output section and the SCSI um, sections, parallel, uh, serial, uh, keyboard, all that input and out output is there, plus the uh, SCSI functionality. Then the middle of it is the video section, uh, plus the usual uh, Amiga specific chipset. The, uh, we have the uh, Denise here, we have uh, the Agnes and also Paula. And at the bottom of it, there's the audio section here, plus the expansion section um, with, uh, with Zorro video and, and ISA slots. Before we dive into the details of it, let me just mention two fixes that I made to it. So one of them is uh, uh, basically cleaning up the battery area and uh, there was some corrosion around around the battery uh, it looked like this I cleaned up some traces I cleaned up some corrosion replaced um, uh, 
and capacitor and uh, now it looks much better uh, like this and I also made another change here this is called int2 or interrupt2 uh, patch which is needed in uh, 3k uh, motherboards to support the expansion uh, via the uh, fast CPU slot so basically uh, by default, A3K motherboards only supported um, CPUs in uh, the fast CPU slot, whereas uh, with this little mod, which is basically running a cable from one of the pins of the fast CPU slot to one of the CIA's, uh, CIA uh, uh, chip pins, you are able to uh, add or to support uh, Zorro functionality on the uh, fast CPU slot uh, and this is specifically needed for uh, Cyberstorm uh, cards which uh, have add-on cards like SCSI or CyberVision and CyberVision is specifically why I needed this um, mod to be done. The mod is very simple uh, and uh, all it uh, took uh, to do it is to basically check off for the con connectivity between those uh, specific two pins. Uh, if there's no connectivity, it means that the uh, motherboard does not uh, support add-on cards to the uh, CPU cards. Uh, in most of the motherboards, you had to actually run a cable from here to here. And now uh, let's dive into the details of uh, some of the interesting stuff uh, that uh, we can learn. Okay, let's start from top right corner and uh, in the very corner there are the initials of the engineers who worked on the motherboard. These are Greg Berlin, Terry Fisher and Ed Günther. I had uh, the biggest problem deciphering the last, last of them but still not as much as uh, in my other uh, video on a 4000T where I actually was unable to decipher some of the uh, engineers listed there and there, are, there were many more listed there. Uh, so the next thing we see uh, here, moving left, are two rows of zip sockets. So this is the top row here and the bottom one, which accepts total of um, 32 uh, zip memory modules. The same format zip module is used for the chip run here. You see, some of them are populated, some of them are not. So by default, the lowest possible configuration was only with the ones here soldered onto the motherboard. I'm talking about chip, uh, chip RAM now, uh, that those eight, uh, eight modules would give you one megabyte of chip memory, but by adding another set of eight, you would get two megabytes. So the, the modules used for chip RAM are 20 are 256k by 4 bits uh, totaling in as i said 2 megabytes of memory if all so sockets are populated whereas for uh, fast ram you are able to use two types of uh, zip chips one is um, uh, 1 megabyte uh, by uh, 4 bits and 32 of them will give you 16 megabyte of fast memory and the other one is the same as in chip RAM, which is 250K, uh, 256K by 4 bits, uh, a jumper here that enables you to switch between those two types of uh, memory modules. Now, moving on, we have our CPU. So this is 68030 CPU, uh, the 50 uh, megahertz one uh, uses a voltage uh, uh, uses a frequency divider uh, to provide 25 megahertz clock to our cpu here and there was a slower version of the motherboard uh, 16 megahertz uh, cpu and it was sw switchable by uh, this jumper and of course you, you have to use a different um, os oscillator uh, on this specific motherboard, there's one more oscillator. This one, this is not a factory mounted one. It's someone made the mod, added a 36 megahertz frequency to drive the FPU. And the FPU is here. The mod was you know, soldering something there. I'm not uh, 
big fan of how it was done, but it's done, I'm not gonna touch it. Uh, right above the battery here, uh, this is the uh, clock chip, uh, so it provides the counters for hours, for days, and it's driven by that battery, well, not driven, uh, it's driven by the uh, system frequency, but uh, it is backed up by the battery, so that uh, the machine doesn't lose the count of uh, dates and clock. But now without the battery, we're going to use an alternative method to uh, set it up with the correct uh, time and date. And that's going to be uh, pinging the NTP server over the network to get the time on boot. Next thing here is the uh, Kickstart ROMs. Uh, and as you see, I've put uh, Amiga Diagnostic ROM here, which, we, which is going to come handy just in a moment. Uh, but the original ones are here, just for the record. I'm going to install those to uh, brand new Kickstart ROMs with 3.2.2 OS on them. But that's later. Right above the Kickstart ROMs, uh, there is a socket which uh, provides the reset functionality plus uh, lock functionality. So the Amiga 3KT uh, can be locked uh, to prevent others accessing your system. And the lock uh, is something we'll discuss later. Moving on, there are two internal sockets here. One is for the internal floppy drive and the other one for internal, internal SCSI devices, most likely hard disks, but uh, not necessarily. Uh, so that's the top row. On the left hand side, starting from the top, there are multiple, multiple connectors. Before we, we go there, let's, let's focus a little bit on the chips surrounding the CPU. So that was our CPU, as we mentioned. By the way, the CPU did not really uh, have to be soldered on the motherboard because the later uh, uh, versions of this PCB uh, meant for, uh, for the use with 040 uh, CPU uh, were actually without any CPU soldered on the motherboard. The CPU was uh, added on a card to the fast CPU slot, like here. This is not an 040, this is 060 uh, Cyberstorm, which I'm going to talk about later, but they were basically added on an add-on card. Um, and also, uh, that configuration didn't have the FPU on the motherboard. So this chip and this chip, they were not there. Uh, they, they, they were only placeholders uh, for them. Super Mag is a SCSI and this controller, uh, and it provides 32-bit uh, direct access uh, to memory, and uh, was supposed to provide like really, really uh, good bandwidth for disk operations. And one of the reasonings that Commodore had was not only to use it with Amiga OS, but also with Amiga Unix system. So, uh, so Amiga has licensed and uh, ported uh, the AT&T Unix system V, uh, which uh, was meant to be installed and was was installed on um, some of the A3000 uh, Amigas. They were marketed as uh, Amiga UX and shipped with that Unix system. Let's move on uh, from Super Mac to Ramsey. And Ramsey is here on the right. And it basically helps manage the onboard 16 megabytes of uh, RAM. Then first we have the whole jumper block, which I'm gonna describe in detail in my uh, article, which will accompany this video. Uh, there are many possible jumper settings. I'm not gonna go to them, uh, into them now. Uh, let's, let's discuss them later. But Fatbuster is here and it provides the uh, control for the uh, Zorro expansion slots. Um, the Amiga 3000 and 3000T were the first ones to support the uh, Zorro 3 uh, expansion slot, uh, in addition to supporting the Zorro 2 uh, for backward com compatibility. Uh, and compared to the earlier version, version that was the main development for uh, for Fatbuster. And another interesting thing here, the this is Superbuster 07. People would often upgrade it to 11 saying, oh, I'm upgrading my 
uh, SuperBuster 211 to fix the DMA bug. Well, no, that's not true. Only version 09 was actually, or actually had to be uh, upgraded to 11 to fix that uh, DMA bug, which uh, which caused freezes uh, on uh, in some configurations. 07 is not buggy, is not flawed. It actually just doesn't support DMA uh, in the way that 09 was meant to support. So basically uh, the upgrade, of course it worked because it provided the DMA support for you, but uh, the, the justification for that to fix the DMA freezing was uh, is often quoted incorrectly. But anyway, let's move on. So FATGARI basically provides the logic and uh, prioritization of signals transmitted to and from CIA's RTC chip, ROMs and Super Mac. So these are the two CIA chips and they provide the supporting logic for floppy drives, for joystick, for serial and parallel ports, even for power LEDs and much, much more. They have uh, many functions across this system. Then right above them is a Western Digital chip, which provides supporting functions for the SCSI interface. Basically it supports, it works with Supert Mac uh, to, uh, to support the SCSI standard. The next one is the first of the ECS chips here, that's Pola, and Pola is unchanged from the first models of Amiga and it of course provides the uh, support for sound, but Pola actually stands for uh, port, audio and UART, uh, so audio is just one of the things that it uh, helps support in the system. Then there is Denis, and Denis displays data buffers, encodes objects to RGB. Oh, that doesn't look good. Displays bit planes and sprites, detects sprites collision as well, and provides mouse support. Many, many functions that it plays, but it's uh, mostly known for its uh, video support functions, especially working with bit planes and, and sprites. Uh, then in, oh, it's worth mentioning that in A3K and N3KT it was enhanced to add uh, additional display modes which were called productivity uh, and super, uh, super res, super high res, sorry. Here is Fat Agnes and Fat Agnes uh, provides a DMA address generation as well as supports the uh, blitter and copper functions for moving large blocks of uh, memory. And in ECS meaning starting from A3K, it supports up to two megabytes of chip RAM. That's the largest memory of chip RAM supported so far by Amigas. There's one more chip that is specific to A3K machines only. So only A3KD and 3KT is the, uh, is the Amber chip. And Amber is the video controller for the uh, video display enhancer, basically providing uh, flicker fixer and scan doubler functionality. A3K and A3KD, uh, sorry, and A3KD and A3KT were the only Amigas with built-in flicker fixer, and that uh, that chip was controlling that. And the uh, Amber chip worked with these memory chips here and here those four and those four and these are fast video memory chips which uh, were expensive and uh, Commodore at certain point uh, considered making the um, flicker fixer and scan doubler functionality in A3K um, optional because of the cost of these chips. So the Amber chip and the fast memory here and the PLL chip were not the only components of the video display enhancer, VDE. There were also two video hybrids. These video hybrids, or vidits as Commodore called them, provided uh, digital to on analog conversion functionality, DAC functionality, basically converting 12-bit uh, image data, RGB data, into uh, three channels 
of analog uh, video signal, each with uh, 15 levels of uh, 16 levels actually of um, uh, of signal. So uh, let's quickly uh, show uh, in detail how they work. I'm using the diagnostic ROMs uh, from John Hertel here. Extremely helpful, a helpful thing whenever you want to troubleshoot your Amiga or just experiment with it. Uh, this is software installed directly in your uh, ROM sockets instead of the uh, kickstart and it gives you all kinds of tests, audio tests, memory tests, IRQ tests, uh, port tests, graphics tests. But for this experiment I'm gonna use the graphics tests. So let's go to the graphics tests and uh, as I mentioned the probe, probes are already connected to uh, uh, and the oscilloscope is displaying the signal from all three of them. So the moment we start the RGB test you will see a very interesting pattern. So look at this. Uh, remember, the yellow probe here is connected to uh, the uh, input signal uh, for the video hybrid and it's connected to the most significant bit. So for the first low eight low, lowest values, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it, it is in low, the most significant bit is in low, while for the remaining eight it is in high here and the second probe the red one or represented here as purple on the oscilloscope it is uh, connected to last but one significant bit so it is an alternating pattern basically but the most interesting thing is happening on the blue probe here which is connected to the analog output of the red uh, of the red signal and look at these stairs here, they go from zero, which corresponds to no red at all, all the way to 15, which corresponds to the most intense red color. I love how it uh, nicely displays on the scope here. Uh, this very uh, little experiment shows the functionality of the video hybrid, also known as Vidiot. Uh, and because this was a custom-built um, uh, integrated circuit by Commodore, uh, they are difficult to uh, obtain. Uh, they were not meant only for the A3K, there were other Amigas that were using that. Uh, if you look at uh, one of my videos in my, uh, in my channel, A600 for example did not use those video hybrids, they used discrete components, um, basically um, a set of resistors uh, put in a, a pattern, in a, in a ladder pattern. So if you look at the video uh, uh, about the red dot traveling through the Amiga system, you will, see, um, uh, you will see how that worked in practice. But what I was meaning to say that these video hybrids uh, were custom built so they are difficult to obtain these days but there's an open source video hybrid model so you can basically build your own if you have the uh, necessary uh, skills and uh, and if you have the um, uh, the parts uh, and tools uh, for that so that's our video hybrid okay moving on from the video display enhancer we go to the sound subsystem driven by uh, Pola, which is here between the video slot and the ISA slots. And it's uh, also quite interesting. Uh, the audio signal is output from Pola. Uh, it is output already in analog form from Pola, as we know, but it undergoes filtration here in this section before it reaches the RCA connector. However, the unfiltered uh, signal is also output to the video slot here, surprisingly. Surprisingly because it's a video slot, not an aud audio slot. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm suspecting, I'm not sure, but I think that it is actually used by the ZZ9K uh, card here, which connects, among others, to the, uh, to the video slot. But uh, there's an add-on to this card. This is a video card, but there's an add-on card. This is an audio, actually a sound card, proper sound card, uh, which has the ability to mix in the signal from Pola 
into its output and I think it uses the uh, uh, it uses the unfiltered polar signal uh, but I'm about to do more research uh, on that by the way the, the uh, uh, RCA output is not the end of the sound path it's also being sent to the bottom of the motherboard here where there's an amplifier for the uh, speaker so uh, this here section this is the actual uh, power amp uh, with uh, some capacitors and resistors and it's um, being output to this little speaker connector here and uh, let's see uh, how that signal actually travels let's make our audio experiment I connected the four probes of the oscilloscope into four different spots on the path of the audio signal the first one is connected to uh, the uh, polar raw output then the next one is connected to the uh, unfiltered uh, output which just underwent some anti-aliasing processing and that's that then the next one is connected again to the video port but to the filtered output it does, it's the same signal that is output to the RCA um, connector uh, which we normally use for outputting polar, sig uh, polar signal and the last probe is connected to the speaker speaker is the amplified version and the amplification happens in this section the amplified version of the line signal output to the RCA um, uh, RCA connector let's see uh, what it looks like on the uh, scope so again let's use our uh, diagnostic ROMs but this time we're gonna pick the audio test option we're gonna output a sound on channel 1 okay channel 1 is the left one and let's we already see that something is happening on the probe on the oscilloscope but let's actually change the frequency of the sound now that's already showing something nice let's set up the triggering now it's stable okay so let me take a snapshot of that what's happening again one by one the first probe is connected to polar out to polar output and you see this is the look of the polar output it is analog it's a wave it's a sine wave here but it's composed of tiny little bars so it's analog but it's composed of discrete pulses uh, very interesting then it undergoes anti-aliasing so it goes into this shape if you zoom it in you see it's still composed of chunks of little chunks or levels discrete levels but it's much smoother than the polar output and this is called the raw output or raw uh, signal and its output to the video slot um, and then it undergoes further filtering and this is the proper line level signal that is output the blue one line level signal that is output on the RCA connectors but also output onto the video slot so you see also how attenuated that uh, blue line is it's the, the amplitude is much lower and even the scope actually doesn't show the scale properly because uh, the blue line is 100 millivolt per square whereas the uh, purple line is 200 millivolt per square so if we make those levels the same that would be the actual shape so it's heavily attenuated compared to the raw output but let's make it more pronounced again the blue one is the line level output to the RCA uh, slots and the another interesting thing that we see is that they are all almost all of them phase shifted so you see the peak is here on the uh, polar output then the peak is shifted on the raw output unfiltered then the filtered one is again phase again phase shifted uh, almost uh, reversed here and then only the amplified signal which is coming here from the 
uh, from the speaker itself is a nice smooth line uh, that is uh, almost face locked to uh, to the line output but again there is also some face shifting that tiny one that you maybe you can see if we zoom it in a little bit the peaks are slightly off so the face shifting happens because of the filtering now let me take a snapshot of this because this experiment shows very nicely how the audio signal is traveling uh, within uh, Amiga 3000 uh, T, 3KT, uh, and we can see everything uh, right on the oscilloscope screen. Yeah. And finally, the expansion section. And the expansion section is quite interesting because as opposed to A3KD, uh, which has the daughter board, which needs to be plugged into the main board, all expansion slots are actually there on the motherboard directly. So we have one, two, three, four, five Zorro slots with Zorro 3 and Zorro 2 um, support. We have one video slot and we have one, two, three, four um, ISA slots. The ISA slots are normally not active they are only powered but no signals are attached to them in order to make use of them you have to use a bridge board a bridge board looks like looks like this and it's being it's plugged into like look it's it spans the entire width of the motherboard it's plugged into both the zoro slot and the iso slot and once plugged in there is a connectivity and signals are attached to the iso slots um, as well. So this is very interesting. Uh, this is uh, an, a card which provides the uh, PC emulation, not actually emulation, it's, a, it's actually a full-fledged PC which you installed into the uh, motherboard and uh, you are able to use the uh, DOS operating system on this Amiga. I'm gonna try it. I never um, ever uh, used this card yet so I'm actually curious if it's working. But this is a 486 uh, uh, 486 uh, bridge board and uh, the ISA slots are exactly for that so once you plug it in then the ISA slots are uh, supporting the regular ISA expansion boards uh, known from uh, your PC computer so that's the uh, motherboard and now let's try and install some software before putting this motherboard back into the case if you're using a modern Amiga OS there's not really much to do configuration-wise, everything is already there. I'm using 3.2.2 and all I have to do is plug in a CF card with a system as it is distributed by Hyperion. Uh, I got a copy from uh, Amiga store, but you can get it from anywhere. Or you can build your own uh, from scratch, but uh, that would uh, deserve a separate video. So we may go into the details later, how to configure your own Amiga OS, but uh, these days if you purchase uh, 3.2.2, for example, uh, you basically are all set. So all you need to do is uh, hook it up to uh, any IDE controller. I'm using Buddha uh, IDE controller uh, here, uh, connected to a CF uh, adapter, IDE CF adapter, and let's just boot the machine. Uh, one note. I already put the 060 um, CPU card here. This is a Cyberstorm Mate 3 um, with 060 uh, CPU uh, because this is how I'm going to use this Amiga. I'm, uh, I'm planning to do uh, some expansions here, which are again out of scope of this video, but uh, uh, this card uh, I wanted to put in first um, because that's definitely the base of my uh, configuration. Uh, it's currently populated with just uh, 40 megs of uh, RAM and I need to replace these sims with uh, something uh, bigger, but let's try and boot it. Uh, so it's booting now. Uh, I already have the Kickstar, uh, Kickstar ROMs here. Again, 3.2.2 corresponding to what I have on the CF card. Uh, so it's all brand new. That's currently the latest, latest Amiga OS version. Uh, let's see uh, how it boots. Well, it booted very fast and this is a clean configuration as it was shipped from uh, Amiga Store. I haven't done anything yet. I just made a backup copy of it 
So let's see. Uh, all I want to do now is check a few things. If the CPU was correctly detected, if the memory was correctly detected, if the boards are detected uh, as they should be, and uh, whether uh, everything else seems same. Uh, all further expansions are outside of the scope of this video. I'm gonna, uh, I'm not gonna spend time on that. I, I may create a separate video, especially on cyber vision configuration, um, Ariadne, which I'm planning to add here, uh, a few other things. But let's focus on the basics. So here it is. Uh, this is our uh, Hyperion Entertainment uh, 3.2.2 uh, Amiga OS, license 20, 2023, copyright 2023, and let's see the about message. The kickstart is 47.111. Workbench version for 47.4. All seems fine. Two megabytes of chip run and 39 megabytes of other memory, which is fast fast run. Now you remember that I do have fast run on uh, the CPU expansion, but I don't have any on board. I'm planning to add more on board, even though it's not really needed when you have a lot on the. Uh, CPU uh, CPU card, but that's that's fine. I still want to uh, have it just for uh, completeness sake. So let's uh, take a look at the obvious obvious basic program, which is the info. Let's check out the memory first. That's for our 40 megabyte of fast RAM. That's our two megabyte of chip RAM. Um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm planning to uh, swap these, these uh, sims with uh, something bigger. Sims are not expensive these days. And let's measure the speed. You can see right away that the processor is correctly detected. It's 060, FPU is 060 plus 68882. Uh, and, uh, and it's pretty fast. So I got 37k dry, dry stones. Uh, this all looks pretty correct. Let's take a look at the boards. And the boards are also looking good here. Let's quit this. Let's go to the CLI. Let's check out the sound information which we can get from shells. So let's start from the, maybe let's start from the CPU. All looks good here. Let's check out the versions. As expected, let's check out the libs directory. Yeah. O6 library is already here, so nothing to install. Uh, all the uh, modern uh, CPU expansions are already supported. And the fuel. Next. Again, you will also see the workbench library is also supplied right on this here. Uh, so in case you will be putting this from Mega 4 KT, you will also uh, the system will also put properly the workbench presence of the workbench library is required for uh, A3 KT and A4 KT. Okay. Now let's check out. So we had the CPU, we had the uh, version now. Let's check available memory. Again, it's showing as expected fast is 39 megabytes, chip is 2 megabytes, and also let's check out the disk or mount configuration. Uh, this is just our CF card as it was partitioned uh, in Amiga store. I haven't touched anything, but I think this is a very nice configuration uh, with. Uh, uh, large enough space for data, large enough space for work, and uh, sufficient for games, work, etc. All looks good. All we need to do is just put it back in the case and also look at some 
things specific to how the case uh, for A3P T uh, is designed. Uh, and then uh, we're closer and closer to wrap, wrapping up this video as a kind of bonus for uh, software configuration part. Let's see if we can run a demo, which is also supplied right away on this CF card, which is, I think, a very cool thing of, uh, of Amiga Store to do. Since it's loading, since it's running, nice, it's starting to be good. The assembly was fun. We started off by thoroughly washing the case. Next, we went on to rebuild the machine piece by piece. The frame of the case is very sturdy and represents the early example of tower form factor. In the early 90s, towers were still a novelty. One editor who reviewed the A3K tower felt it necessary to explain why the computer seems to be standing on its side, as most computers back then had desktop form factor. The fan is solid and still not too noisy, so I decided not to replace it yet. By the way, it is funny how an early leaker before the official announcement misinterpreted the fan grill as a speaker in the Amiga magazine. The Chinon FB357A floppy drive slides into the bay on two rails attached to its side and then is fixed by a screw-on bracket. Similar C-shaped brackets are used in the LED and lock panel and in the drive cage. The top front panel has a power switch, SCSI and power LEDs, and a key lock, all of them linked to the connector CN302 on the motherboard. Turning the key first shorts one pair of cables to do the actual locking, that is to block the mouse and keyboard signals, and then another pair to perform a hardware reset. The key lock in my Amiga was broken, only the external shell was there, the core was missing. I bought a Velman KS5 switch to replace it. The replacement switch looks and feels very much like the original, but it does not offer the additional turn position to do the reset, so I'm looking for an even better replacement. Similarly to the later Amiga 4K tower, the 3K tower had an internal drive cage, which serves two purposes. It adds space for mounting several more internal drives and reinforces the frame even more. Some users back in the days would remove the cage, again similarly to A4K tower, to facilitate access to the motherboard. And my Amiga 3000T came with the cage removed, so I had to order a replacement. I believe the only person who makes and sells these replacement cages these days is Shimon Gosk, who offers the service at amibay.com at the link displayed below. And his work is utterly stunning. It is cut to the precise shape and dimensions of the original bracket, furnished with all the required guiding rails and hard disk mounting plate, and made of high quality polished material which called for wide glove treatment on my part.
Well, that's the story of this computer restoration. For now, I'm happy with this basic setup and I'm enjoying the mods on IMP3 player via the ingenious Inbox plug. I have tons of plans for this Amiga. I will be adding CyberVision video card, the Commodore PC bridge board, trying out many sound cards. I'll be documenting the expansion in future videos, so subscribe and stay tuned. A lot of fun ahead of us. First though, let's bring this video to conclusion and understand this Amiga's impact on home computing. Well, Amiga 3000 Tower was not a success and it was launched when Commodore's demise had already started. The company did not have a good product roadmap and yet its management earned top money in the IT sector. Employees and users saw that very well and Commodore's reputation was becoming worse and worse every year. At the same time, the competition had already caught up with Apple offering 040 chip-based Macintoshes and PCs being equipped with better and better sound and video cards. 486DX2 CPUs and the ESA architecture had just been announced and IT journalists were raving about them. A3000 Tower was doomed to be a niche product and Commodore's cavalier approach to marketing only made it worse. The machine was hardly even mentioned in the same general computing magazines where the competitors were running full-page ads promoting computers which had better features, were more powerful and at the same time were cheaper than this. Amiga 3000 Tower, no matter how impressive an engineering design it was, was doomed from the day it was announced. It was too expensive, offered too little. Given that A3000 Tower was really just the version of 3000 in a tower case, and that distributors and Commodore themselves were already offering bundles and deals on A3000 at the time when this tower was announced, it just didn't make any sense to buy the tower. It cost a lot more and all it gave you is a few expansion slots. So if you had many discs or many expansion um, cards, that made some sense, but still was too expensive. The ill-fated machine and the entire ECS architecture was quickly to be replaced by the new AGA or AGA-based line of Amigas. But even those were destined to fail, as Commodore did not have a, any viable plan to compete with the PC clones. In the next two years, the company would go bankrupt and its two tower computers are now nothing but a nostalgic story of the past.